Good afternoon and welcome everyone. We are so happy that you're here with us today. I'm Marilee McFarland, the Senior Director of Alumni and Field Relations. And the music you heard as you, as you joined is from Principia alum Ian Case. We hope that you will start by entering in the chat box where you're joining us from today. I know that we have alumni and friends joining us from all over the world. And we are just so grateful that you're here for this book talk on New York Times bestseller, Leadership in Turbulent Times by Doris Kearns Goodwin. I hope that you enjoyed reading the book as much as I did. From the time I heard Doris Kearns Goodwin speak at Principia College, I have been a huge fan of hers and loved diving in to her thoughts on leadership, looking at these four different presidents. And I'm just thrilled to hear Dr. John Glenn speak with us today and share more about these presidents and their leadership style. So we hope that you will join us for some of our upcoming events. Tomorrow night, you will have a special opportunity to hear from members of Principia's Board of Trustees as part of the Straight Talk Principia 22 Roundtable. Hear updates and ask questions in this candid conversation with Principia Trustees Steve DeWint, Kristen Jamerson, and Board Chair Dr. Scott Schneeberger. We also hope that you will join us on Tuesday, February 24th for the 21st annual Monitor Night Live. Here, Principia College President John Williams in a conversation with the Christian Science Monitor Editor, Mark Sappenfield and correspondents, Story Hinckley, Stephanie Haynes Wilson and Noah Robertson. As they talk about the topic of journalism in an unfiltered social media world and discuss the question, can we trust the media? Sounds like a fascinating discussion and we hope that you will tune in for that. The listing for all of our upcoming events and a link to register for them can be found at principia.edu slash events. I'll post that link in the chat box. I would love to introduce you to our speaker today. Many of you are familiar with Dr. John Glenn who grew up on an 80 acre alfalfa farm in Scottsdale, Arizona. After graduating from Arizona State, he became a U.S. Army helicopter pilot, serving as a medical evacuation pilot and earning a Distinguished Flying Cross in Vietnam, where he served from 1971 to 1972. Following his discharge, he flew for, for the U.S. Forest Service in support of wildland fire control for 14 years. And he just shared with me that he's still flying, so you'll have to ask him more about that. In 1989, Dr. Glenn joined the Principia College Athletics Department as an assistant football coach and women's softball coach. And in 1993, he was appointed the college faculty as, a, as an assistant professor of history and a position he retained until 2009. He, in 2014, Dr. Glenn and his wife, Dorsey, the former Dean of Students at Principia College, both retired and moved to Maui. Sounds like they made an amazing choice. John has served as a lecturer and will be serving as a lecturer on future Principia lifelong learning trips. So stay tuned for more information about upcoming trips with Dr. Glenn. If you have any questions during today's talk, feel free to enter them in the Q&A box throughout the event. And there will be time for some Q&A at the end of the event. So John, we give you a hearty aloha and are so grateful for your time today. And I now turn it over to you. Thanks, Marilee. Let me see if I can share this screen and bring up what we need. Here we go. Can uh, Hopefully you guys can all see that. Uh, yeah, I would say good morning. It's morning still here in Maui. And I want to go to from beginning. Okay. Share now. Share no. Uh. It's just that that first button over to your left from beginning. The video. I think down. You want to go down to the PowerPoint and then. Or yeah, from I can't get to it. There you go. There we go. Okay, got it. Yeah. 
Okay, so as Marilee pointed out, this is uh, the book, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Leadership in Turbulent Times, published in 2018. And this is Doris. I'm gonna call her Doris if you don't mind. We're not on first name basis, but nonetheless, it'll be simpler then. As Marilee pointed out, um, I taught at Principia College for um, almost 20 years, loved it. Before that, I was working for the US Forest Service flying helicopters. We would put out fires in the summer and actually did prescribed burning in the winter to burn away as much of the uh, accumulated undergrowth as possible. And that's one of the situations that we're facing now every summer as we have these huge fires. And before that, as she pointed out as well, I was flying medical evacuation in Vietnam from 71, 72. But we're not here to talk about me. We're talking about leadership by Doris Kearns Goodwin. And as Marilee also pointed out, there's she talks about four different presidents uh, ab about whom she's written a biography of each of the four, uh, Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt and Linda Johnson. So she begins with Abraham Lincoln, of course, and she asked the question in the beginning, are leaders born or made? And also where does ambition come from? And how does adversity affect the growth of leadership? And lastly, and many historians ask this question, does the leader make the times or do the times make the leader? And the obvious, uh, most obvious example is World War II where you have Stalin and Hitler and FDR all together at the same time. Uh, her book is divided into really four parts. Part one is ambition and the recognition of leadership. And Lincoln says every man is said to have a peculiar ambition. And Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt says, I rose like a rocket. Um, the, she calls Lyndon Johnson a steam engine in pants. Um, her second section is adversity and growth and how Lincoln was uh, uh, often melancholy and Theodore Roosevelt's uh, situation with his wife and his mother that we'll talk about. And Franklin Roosevelt, of course, uh, his affliction of polio and Johnson uh, had some difficult times uh, with regard to depression as well. Part three is the leader and their times. And she talks about how they led during uh, moments of crisis uh, especially Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation and Theodore Roosevelt and the 1902 Cold Strike and then Franklin Roosevelt and the first hundred days and visionary leadership with Lyndon Johnson and this, mostly the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then finally, she ends with epilogue, uh, death and remembrance. Um, the one criticism that I saw several times about this book was that it was chopped up this way. Part one is their early life. Part two is, um, oh, their 30s and 40s. And part three was the presidential activities. And so I was organized, and, and that was, as I say, a, a criticism of the book by some people. They thought it was chopped up too much. So I've organized my slides and my talk um, strictly chron chronologically. Uh, the one thing I would like you to talk to think about as we go through it, and I'll mention it numerous times, she talks at length about the difference between transactional leadership and transformational leadership. The first transactional uh, appeals to self-interest, uh, kind of a quid pro quo, I'll give you this if you give me that. And transformative, of course, inspires the followers to higher goals. She argues that ambition and the overcoming of adversity by resilience um, results in the most compelling examples of leadership. So as I said, she starts with uh, Abraham Lincoln and her book on Lincoln, of course, is Team of Rivals. Um, this is more, uh, not so much a biography of Lincoln, but more a study of his cabinet. Um, she finds a bunch of letters from cabinet members' wives, and she weaves them into a biography of Lincoln and a study of his early days, and of course, most importantly, the Emancipation Proclamation. And this is Francis Carpenter's famous painting 
of Lincoln reading the Emancipation Proclamation to the cabinet. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Lincoln, of course, uh, um, born in 1809 in Kentucky, and this is a slide of his uh, boyhood home. He lives on several uh, very small farms. His father is a hard scrabble farmer, Thomas Lincoln. His mother, Nancy Hanks, dies when he's nine of what they call the milk sickness. Um, uh, but Lincoln writes that all that I am or ever shall hope to be, he owes to his loving mother. Uh, Thomas Lincoln marries Sarah Bush Lincoln um, while, Link while Abraham Lincoln is 10. And historians often wonder whether Lincoln is talking about his loving mother, Sarah Hanks, uh, uh, right here, Nancy Hanks, or Sarah Bush Johnson. And I'm not clear on it either. I don't know which one he's um, so reverent about. Uh, Nancy Hanks, his mother, until he's nine, so for his very early adolescence, but then from nine to 18, Sarah Bush Johnson, Lincoln. Doris Kearns Goodwin points out uh, one of the first character traits of Lincoln, of course, is his uh, honesty. Uh, he borrows a book from a guy depicted in this slide here, and the book gets damaged in a rainstorm, and the guy forces Lincoln to work off the price of the book, and Lincoln was uh, willing to do that. He didn't think it was quite right, but he was willing to do it, and it shows an early example of his character. He didn't get along well with his father. Uh, the father always wanted him to work the farm, and Lincoln wanted higher pursuits, and he was reading all the time. And as soon as he was old enough, he walked from the family farm to New Salem, Illinois, where he was splitting logs and, of course, became fam famous as a rail splitter and also worked in the general store. And the general store work made a huge impression on Lincoln because he met a lot of people that way. And that was one of the ways and uh, means for him to really run for elected office early on. He loses his first election for a local political office, but he's uh, pleased that he gets by far the majority vote of the citizens of New Salem. <clears throat> so he thinks that people that know him probably will support him, and he's pretty much right. This is the first picture of Lincoln, 1846. He has a very long neck and very long arms and legs, and many of the pictures show his very long neck and arms and wrists and ankles. And you can see here, this is a specially tailored suit and shirt that covers up his long neck and his uh, long arms. And this is, of course, Mary Todd, also taken in uh, 1846 at the same time, his wife. They're married in 1842 and married until Lincoln is assassinated in 1865. This is, of course, my wife, Dorsey, and I have to include a picture of her and a short um, comment about her because most of the people at Principia are familiar with her. Um, she was dean of students, and she's so well known that she would often get mail just addressed to Dorsey, Principia College. They couldn't remember her name, and whenever I'm giving a talk, people always write in and say, I uh, enjoyed your talk, John. Thanks very much. How's Dorsey? And uh, have Dorsey call me. So she plays an integral part in the Principia story. This is a uh, slide of Lincoln and uh, one of the most famous cases that he handled. Uh, it's called the Duff, D-U-F-F, -F, Duff Armstrong case in which uh, Duff was on trial for murder and the main witness against him claimed that he saw Duff murder this guy by the light of the moon. And Lincoln was able to look it up in an almanac and find out that there was no moon that night. Uh, I just threw this picture in. I thought you might be interested in it. It's the house that Lincoln and uh, Mary shared in Springfield, Illinois at uh, 8th and Jackson. I used to take my students up there on uh, Lincoln's birthday and see the house. And one of the things I like about it is that you can see the three fellows in the foreground. There's actually three guys there. Um, the one is blurry. And at the time, uh, photography uh, was so 
early in its um, ber uh, in its uh, inception uh, that if you ha that you had to stand still. And so this kid has been moving and he's lost to history. Uh, but they did blow up the picture of Lincoln and Tad, and you can see them there standing in front of the house. Uh, this is the picture that a lot of historians think made Lincoln president. He's speaking at the Cooper Union Institute in New York, and he's got a um, tailored suit of clothes on. You can see the, the sleeves are a little too long and the collar's pretty high. He looks very serious. He's got his hand on a book that either uh, shows his constituents that he can read, or perhaps it's the Bible, but either one will work as a positive uh, PR uh, method. Of course, runs for president in 1860. And I like this slide a lot too. They misspell his name and they've got his picture in there sideways. And he gets about 40% of the vote in the 1860 election. I often used to tell my classes that I would kind of wish that John Bell had won the election in 1860 because the Constitutional Union Party, their policy, their, their platform was uh, essentially um, keep things as they are. Uh, don't do anything with slavery. And if Bell could have been elected in 1860 and then reelected, let's say in 1864, and then another constitutional union member with the same policy elected two more times after that, the Industrial Revolution is right over the horizon and possibly obviating the need for slaves, but it doesn't happen. The Democratic Party splits in 1860, and you can see Stephen Douglas in red getting almost 30% and John Breckinridge in the South getting about 18%. And historians have wondered if you put those three together, they would have about 60% because Lincoln only got about 40%, but in reality, he got the electoral vote by a long margin. As he does though, uh, South Carolina secedes from the Union and this is Lincoln's first test of, as president of what do we do? Uh, Lincoln's policy, the, the um, Republican Party had decided that their platform was going to stand on no extension of slavery into the territories. Lincoln's not an abolitionist, but he will not allow the extension of slavery into the territories. And so any Southerner who's paying attention can see that pretty soon there's going to be uh, the non-slavery states are going to outnumber the slavery states and the non-slave states are going to be able to elect, elect more representatives, elect more senators, probably elect the president because of the population. The president can appoint the Supreme Court and they're going to be the minority party. And so they feel that since they entered the Constitution voluntarily, they can leave the Union voluntarily as well. And Lincoln is very concerned. There's 11 Confederate states initially, and Lincoln's concerned about these ones you see in yellow here. They're the border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. And if they secede from the Union, that'll allow then 15 states uh, in this Southern Confederacy, 23 states then in the Union, but relatively close numbers. Uh, and also a major problem will be if um, Maryland and Delaware secede, they will then surround the Capitol in Washington, DC, and they'll have to, the Union will have to move its capital to either New York or Boston or someplace. And so that's fraught with problems. So Lincoln um, makes every effort to keep the border states in the Union. And so the Civil War ensues, of course, 1861 to 1865. In, 18, in the summer of 1862, Lincoln has decided that he's going to play the race card. He's going to do something about the blacks in bondage. Uh, he invites in a number of border state representatives and he tells them, here's, here's my plan. I'm going to begin a program of compensated, gradual emancipation, and we're going to relocate these emancipated slaves back to Africa. That's the plan. It's got three parts. We're going to pay, the federal government's going to pay $400 for every slave, man, woman, child, um, small baby, uh, older man, older woman, it doesn't matter, $400. It's going to take about 40 years, so it'll be gradual, um, completed maybe around 1900. 
uh, and we're going to ship them all to back to Africa. So America will be totally white. Now, Lincoln, as I said, is not an abolitionist, but he does feel no extension of slavery. We're going to keep the slaves in the deep South. This is a firm, famous uh, pic picture of a guy named Gordon that is widely distributed by the abolitionist. But as I say, Aboli uh, Lincoln is not an abolitionist. Don't get that wrong. One other thing Lincoln feels about the uh, abolition is that it will increase the numbers of the Union Army. Black troops, of course, white officers, but black troops. And of course, he gets about 180,000 troops, black troops. The border state representatives say to Lincoln, no, we won't support compensated emancipation. We won't support gradual emancipation. We're not supporting emancipation whatsoever. So this is in July of 1862, and Lincoln decides, OK, then I'm going to emancipate the slaves. And so uh, this is this famous painting of Francis Carpenter, where Lincoln reads the Emancipation Proclamation that he's written to his cabinet. He doesn't ask them if they think that he should do it. He says, it's a fait accompli, it's done, but I want your views on it. And Secretary of State Stanton, who's seated here facing Lincoln in the foreground, he says, I, I'm concerned about the time that we issue it. We need to have a um, victory, a military victory in order to back it up. Uh, and the Southern Confederacy had been winning most of the battles up to this time. Lincoln says, okay, I'll wait till we get a victory. And the victory comes at Antietam in September of 1862. Lincoln decides, okay, now the time is right. This is a picture of him visiting the troops at Antietam. And you can see he's facing General McClellan. Uh, you might be interested on the far right in the slouch hat and the, with the saber showing the guy at the farthest right is Captain George Armstrong Custer, later to became, become famous uh, in the West. Lincoln says, okay, I'll wait until we have a victory. He gets it at Antietam. It's not a huge victory. Lincoln uh, knows that Lee had invaded um, Maryland and the invasion has been stopped. And so he calls it a victory and he issues the Emancipation Proclamation at that time. He gives the South three, essentially three months till January 1st. At, come January 1st, that's when the Emancipation Proclamation is going to go into effect. Um, Doris Kearns Goodwin thinks that the Emancipation Proclamation is the most compelling example of Lincoln's leadership, showing his resilience over adversity. The Union troops had been losing battle after battle, but Lincoln um, is ready to uh, accomplish this major transformational activity when uh, I think you could argue successfully that Lincoln's leadership is transformational. Uh, he establishes the policy that the states are subservient to the federal government and also frees almost 4 million slaves. This is the final picture of Abraham Lincoln, of course, assassinated in April of 1865 by John Wilkes Booth. I think this is the best book on Lincoln. As I said, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's book is um, a lot about the cabinet and there's a lot of insight in it. This is strictly a biography by David Herbert Donald and it is very good. She then moves on to Theodore Roosevelt and her book on Theodore Roosevelt is called The Bully Pulpit. And again, she's going to talk about resilience over adversity and how ambition plays a role in the presidential uh, leadership and the individual's growth itself. And she also, uh, again, focuses on transactional leadership versus transformative leadership. This is Roosevelt's father, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., and his mother, Maddie, who's an unrestricted, unreconstructed Southern belle from Georgia. She reminds me a lot of uh, Scarlett O'Hara from um, Gone with the Wind. I'm, every time I watch Gone with the Wind, I just want to slap Scarlett because she just doesn't catch on to what's going on with between her and Rhett. But nonetheless, this is Theodore Roosevelt as a young boy. And this is a, a picture of the Lincoln's uh, 
funeral cortege going through New York City. And on the left is a brownstone owned by Roosevelt's grandfather. And in the top floor that you can see there, uh, historians have actually blown that picture up and they find a young Theodore Roosevelt and his brother Elliot in that top floor. Roosevelt, the Roosevelt boys watching the Lincoln funeral procession. Theodore Roosevelt is uh, not a healthy young boy. He has a bad case of asthma. Uh, and his father tells him you have a great mind, but not a strong body and you need to build up your body. So they go nuts with um, exercises and uh, Roosevelt Sr. builds a gym for Theodore and Theodore is able to build up his body uh, to match his mind. This is a picture of him as a wrestler at Harvard. In uh, 1882, he marries um, uh, Anne Hathaway Lee. Um, they are only married for a relatively short time. And on uh, February 12th of 1884, during childbirth, uh, um, his wife dies. And the same day, his mother dies. And Roosevelt puts in his diary a um, large X over the date of February 12th, 1884. He says, the light has gone out of my life with the death of his mother and his wife. He gives his baby Alice over to his daughter, uh, sister Corinne uh, and goes out to his ranch in the Dakotas where he stays for almost two years. He's a working cowboy on this ranch. After he recovers from the uh, multiple deaths, um, he comes back to New York and begins his political rise. He uh, works in the Civil Service Commissioner and he's also New York City Police Commissioner where he really makes his name. He and the guy behind him, this guy named Jacob Reese, who is an author of a famous book called How, How the Other Half Lives. He's a uh, sociologist essentially and he and Roosevelt as police commissioner make the rounds uh, midnight to 2 a.m. waking up sleeping policemen and having them either discharged or um, make them uh, aware of their duties and he becomes a very successful New York City police commissioner and one of the tv shows that I like is called Blue Bloods and the hero here is Tom Selleck and I think they make him kind of out to be another Theodore Roosevelt he's always wearing a three-piece suit which is what Theodore Roosevelt would have worn he's got glasses he's got the mustache he's a big guy and pictures of Theodore Roosevelt are in his office all the time I, I have no evidence to back this up but I think they they like to connect Tom Selleck with Theodore Roosevelt Comes uh, 1898, Theodore Roosevelt is now Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Uh, and we are having problems with the Spanish over Cuba and um, yellow journalism is at its height. This is a drawing by Frederick, uh, Frederick Remington of Spanish officials doing a strip search of a woman. And we of course find that to be offensive. And pretty soon the warship USS Maine is sunk in Havana Harbor and we go to war with the Spanish or essentially over their uh, treatment of the Cuban people. Theodore Roosevelt resigns his assistant secretary of the Navy position and becomes the lieutenant colonel of the first volunteer cavalry. And this is a picture of Theodore Roosevelt in the center there, just underneath the American flag with his uh, rough riders, as he calls them, uh, after they have taken the San Juan Heights, they charge up Kettle Hill in uh, the summer of 1898. It's what um, John Hay calls a splendid little war, it takes place about three months in the summer of 1898. Theodore Roosevelt writes about it afterwards and his detractors argue that the book that he writes about it should be called Alone in Cuba because it highlights all of Theodore Roosevelt's successes while he's there in Cuba during the summer. The uh, first volunteer cavalry, the Rough Riders are forced to charge up San Juan Hill on foot uh, because there wasn't room to bring their horses over on the transports from Tampa. But Theodore Roosevelt is on horseback initially. He's on a horse called Little Texas. Uh, and he ca catches on to the fact that he is a by far the most conspicuous target as they charge up Kettle Hill. 
And so he gets off the horse and leads the charge on foot. There's a Roosevelt family. Um, his second wife uh, eat, um, on the second from the right and his son Quentin on the far left, the youngest boy. Uh, this is uh, taken in uh, 1902 and the Quentin uh, becomes a pilot in World War I and when he is shot down and killed, uh, Theodore Roosevelt is affected dramatically by his death and Theodore Roosevelt actually dies shortly after Quentin's death. He is elected governor of New York and then kicked upstairs to run as vice president with McKinley and with McKinley's death in September of 1901, Theodore Roosevelt becomes president of the United States. I like this picture a lot because it shows Theodore Roosevelt, he's got his hand on the globe, of course, and we're going to make America um, an international policeman. He's got a three-piece suit on, he's well-dressed, he's got the chain to his pocket watch. Uh, the chair there to his left is uh, probably an expensive leather chair, um, and it's showing Theodore Roosevelt at the height of his power. Speak softly and carry a big stick. This is uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's main example of the most compelling example of Theodore Roosevelt's leadership, and she argues that it is transformational leadership. A coal strike in 1902, 147,000 miners in Pennsylvania go out to strike for higher wages, and the people need the coal. The, the strike takes place in the summer, um, and uh, it looks like we're not going to, the people that really need it, especially Pennsylvania, are not going to get the coal that they need. And Uncle Sam says, we must have that coal. So Theodore Roosevelt invites in the coal um, leaders of the, the owners of the coal mines, and he persuades them to work with management, uh, to work with the union, excuse me, and uh, comes up with a final answer for the coal strike after three months. And uh, while this does get the coal to the people, the more, the more important thing is that the first time the federal government has intervened in a strike between management and the union and sets a precedent. The, this uh, picture here calls it Roosevelt's biggest game. He has shot down the coal strike. I think I would disagree slightly with um, Doris Kearns Goodwin as this being the most compelling example of Theodore Roosevelt's leadership. Um, internationally, he is the main driving force behind the uh, completion of the Panama Canal. Colombia had disallowed uh, having the canal built through their, their uh, country and the Panamanian Republic results out of that. And Theodore Roosevelt negotiates with the Panama folks and they're able to establish a uh, canal and of course becomes hugely important throughout the rest of the um, century and even today. He's also a major conservationist. Here he is um, with John Muir and he creates the US Forest Service. He establishes 150 national forests, 51 bird reserves, 18 national monuments, and sets aside 230 million acres of public lands. So I think there's a good case to be made for this as being his main transformational issue, uh, example of leadership. And also he negotiates the end to the Russo-Japanese War, uh, again, transformational uh, giving the uh, Russians what they need and the Japanese what they need. And he receives the Nobel Peace Prize for this 1906. So there's a lot to be considered insofar as leadership, uh, especially transformational type, as far as Theodore Roosevelt has decided. Uh, I think there's uh, the coal strike is certainly important, but these other three are important as well. Theodore Roosevelt leaves the presidency, of course, in 1908 and uh, asks that his uh, next president, that the country's next president be William Howard Taft. 
and they get in a battle after Theodore Roosevelt comes back and Theodore Roosevelt decides that he can run for president again since there's been a hiatus period of four years between when he left the presidency and running for it again. And during the campaign in October of uh, 1912, Theodore Roosevelt's actually, uh, there's an attempt made on his life. An assassin shoots Theodore Roosevelt in the chest and his uh, glasses case and his speech stop the bullet from killing him, but it actually does enter his body. And Theodore Roosevelt never won for uh, avoiding publicity. Uh, he goes on and gives the speech. And as he speak, as he get, get, walks onto the to the stage, he asks the audience to be quiet because there's a bullet in his body. And of course, there's a hush comes over the audience and he's able to give his speech and then to the hospital. Oh, one other thing that you can argue that would be an, uh, uh, an example of his transformational leadership is his extensive writings. And this is just a partial example of the writings of Theodore Roosevelt. I think the best book on Theodore Roosevelt is The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morse. This is a terrific book. If you ever want to read a biography and especially one about Theodore Roosevelt, you can't put this book down. It is truly a page turner. The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris. She next moves to Franklin Roosevelt, of course, seen here with Eleanor, his wife, and her book on them is No Ordinary Time, a real good book about the trials and tribulations of the family of the Roosevelts. This is Franklin Roosevelt as a young boy. I know it looks like a girl. He's quite the mama's boy as he's growing up. Here he is at uh, Groton. He marries Eleanor um, and Eleanor's father, a uh, really tragic story is um, Theodore Roosevelt's brother and Elliot, her father is an alcoholic and it's, uh, is in such a bad way that the president of the United States at the time, Theodore Roosevelt actually gives the bride away. The other woman in the picture is Sarah Delano Roosevelt, Franklin's mother. And you often see pictures of them with Franklin and Sarah standing next to him. And then Eleanor, it's almost like Sarah comes between the two of them. And as I said, uh, he's quite the mama's boy, loves his mother dearly. Sarah, for a wedding gift, gives to Eleanor and Franklin a brownstone in New York. And she buys the brownstone next door and has doors put in between the two um, on each of the three floors so that she can enter Franklin and Eleanor's home anytime she wishes. And this of course causes great consternation for Eleanor, but she's able to live with it. Here they are with two of the children. Franklin is going to follow Theodore Roosevelt's um, progress in politics. He goes on to be Assistant Secretary of the Navy in the Wilson administration during World War I, and then runs for vice president, just as Theodore Roosevelt had done. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Cox. They run for president and vice president in 1920. And the cool thing about this picture, of course, is you can see Franklin Roosevelt walking. This is 1920, and he is affected by polio in 1921 never to walk again. This is a simple wheelchair. You can see uh, just a wooden chair with <clears throat> wheels on it, no motor, no nothing. Uh, and there's only two pictures of Franklin in his wheelchair. He made a deal with the um, photographers that they wouldn't take pictures of him because he was afraid that it might affect his presidency. There's This is one and this is the other. And this is his dog Fala on his lap. And this is uh, not one of his children. This is the daughter of uh, his uh, landscape guy, the guy taking care of the landscaping at the White House. Those are the only two pictures of him in the wheelchair. But he's convinced that the waters at Warm Springs, Georgia will uh, bring his legs back into use. And he even buys the place. Uh, it's a kind of a bed and breakfast type situation in Warm Springs, Georgia, and he goes down there as often as possible, and they call it even the Little White House. In fact, that's where he dies in 1945. Becomes governor of New York um, before his presidency, and as Wall Street crashes in 1929, he is governor of New York. 
Um, not that many people, Americans, are involved in the in the uh, stock market, but there's a trickle down effect. And so, as someone who has lost virtually all of their savings in the Wall Street crash, now that person who would normally buy, say, a new car can't afford to buy the new car, and the car manufacturer now doesn't need as many tires, and it trickles down and pretty soon affects all of uh, America, as you're well aware. Hoover says prosperity is just around the corner, and this guy in the background taking a header at Wall Street, well, maybe not this corner. Franklin Roosevelt elected president in 1932, November 1932, the inauguration taking place in March of 1933. Hoover not happy, Franklin Roosevelt ebullion. The Dow Jones average tops out at 400 in 1928. Of course, it's now about 35,000. So the top just before the depression, 400. And you can see dropping, <clears throat> dropping down below 50 uh, at the height of the depression. And this is a chart showing unemployment and as you can see, in 1929, unemployment is around 1 million. And by 1933, it's at 12 million and actually gets to 15 million. A slight uh, success rate for the New Deal, but then drops back down in 1938. And the New Deal really doesn't get us out of the Depression. It's World War II that does that as we put workers back to work making airplanes and guns and bullets and all that stuff. But Doris Kearns Goodwin spends her time with regard to Franklin Roosevelt and his transformational leadership issue with regard to the runs on the banks. As the Depression worsens, people move to go to the banks to withdraw their savings, of course. And banks, as you're well aware, don't keep all that money in their safety deposit boxes. Sometimes I had to use, used to have to tell my students about how banks actually work, that they take your savings in and say, pay you 2%, uh, hardly now, uh, but then they loan it out at, say, 6%, and the 4% in the middle is how the banks make their profit. Um, but a lot of Americans at this time are unaware of that, and a lot of the students that we see in college are also unaware of that. And the Americans think they can go to the bank and get their savings out, and pretty soon a lot of banks have to close uh, because they don't have any money left. There's no cash reserves, not insufficient cash reserves for them to pay off the people. Franklin Roosevelt decides <clears throat> that he's going to close all the banks. It's a banking holiday, and he's going to close them for a week, and he goes on public radio with, with the first of his fireside chats. And he says, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That famous, famous phrase uh, in FDR lore. And believe it or not, he convinces the people, the American people, that he's right and that the banks are actually safe. They reopen banks, a number of banks after a week the most uh, solvent of the banks, and people begin to put their savings back into the banks. And the um, banking crisis is actually handled by FDR. And Doris Kearns Goodwin argues that this is a wonderful example of transformational leadership, and I would agree. Love this drawing because uh, he's now taking care of the financial crisis came in uh, like a lion, but you're going out like a lamb. And the really cool thing about this one is Roosevelt has his legs working. He can walk. Historians have estimated that between 80, 80 and 85 percent of the American public was unaware that Franklin Roosevelt could not walk. Um, he, he, um, when he has to give speeches, he puts these 12 pounds of braces on his legs and he's either standing at the podium when they let the people in, or he's actually can sort of walk. He uses a cane and he puts his other arm on an aid, often his son Jimmy, and he's able to actually just pull his hips forward and drag his legs. And he's, of course, walking very, very slowly, but when he's working a crowd, he is talking to the crowd, hello, nice to see you, thanks for coming, nice to see you. And so he would be walking slowly as he moves through the crowd. And so the, uh, much of the American public is unaware that he actually can't walk. 
Of course, through the New Deal, he establishes all these different programs to um, fight the depression, the Works Progress Administration, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Agricultural Adjustment uh, Act, and Dr. New Deal, FDR, is going to heal ailing Uncle Sam with the support of Congress. About this same time in the early 30s, the Dust Bowl uh, occurs and damaging the ecology in Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas. Um, and it's estimated that 1 billion tons of topsoil um, over um, 100 million acres actually is blown away. And of course, difficult times for the farmers at the same time as the depression. Lots of displaced Americans leave Texas, Oklahoma, <clears throat> heading for California and the promised land. Um, wonderfully shown in um, John Steinbeck's book, The Grapes of Wrath, and also the movie uh, with Henry Fonda. This picture is taken in Kingman, Arizona, not too far from where I grew up in Prescott, Arizona. Jobless men keep going. Now, this is one of the most famous pictures coming out of the depression. It's called Migrant Mother. And <clears throat> it's a, a photograph done by Dorothea Lang. Dorothea Lang was working for the Farm Service Administration, and she was sent out to take pictures for the New Deal to convince the rest of America that there really was a depression. Some of the Americans weren't even affected by the depression. <clears throat> There's a famous story about the DuPont family they were being asked to uh, support Sunday afternoon classical music uh, on the radio. And they said, no, we wouldn't be willing to do that to support this monetarily because all our friends between two and four in the afternoon on Sundays, they're out playing polo and they wouldn't be able to listen to the um, classical music. Uh, again, this is Dorothea Lang and it, she, takes some pictures that are, are used by the New Deal for propaganda purposes, very much like Migrant Mother. This is a CCC camp, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which put uh, thousands of young men to work. This is a camp that picture was taken from the helicopter I was flying. I was in Alturas, California on a forest fire. And uh, once we got the forest fire out, the uh, Forest Service guy said, hey, you're a historian, aren't you? There's a CCC camp that's still there. Um, and let's fly over there and take a picture of it. Also establishes, of course, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, flooding in central Tennessee and northern Alabama, northern Mississippi for decades before. And the New Deal establishes a series of dams and uh, hydroelectric power in the valley, in the area that's still um, very successful for them. Of course, internationally, FDR is forced to deal with Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler and the international crisis that results in World War II. Neville Chamberlain thinks that he has worked out a deal with Hitler, but you, of course, can't trust Hitler. He moves into the Rhineland in 1936 and then uh, acquires Austria and then the Sudetenland and then Czechoslovakia. And then he's moving into Poland and finally, um, the uh, French and the British decide to declare war on them. This is a slide showing the Russian-German pact in August of 1939 with Stalin there in the white coat. And once that pact is signed, Poland's fate is um, all pretty much um, taken and the, the Germans are gonna take half and the Russians are gonna take half. This is a chilling picture that I put in. Uh, this is Adolf Hitler, of course, in June of 1940 uh, in front, in, in Paris, in front of the Eiffel Tower. Um, oh, I love this picture. This is FDR uh, meeting Winston Churchill at the very beginning of uh, World War II. Uh, and I love this because of the, you see uh, Franklin Roosevelt's pants, the legs on them. It looks like the tailor forgot to work on them. <clears throat> but this is actually by design so that when Roosevelt is sitting in his wheelchair, um, people can't see the braces on his legs that are covered up by the long pant legs. 
course, we go to war in December 7th when we're attacked by the Japanese. They, people often ask me, why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? And the reason is they were trying to get their raw materials and continue to move in a southwesterly direction. And one of the main maxims insofar as military is concerned is you never allow an enemy to remain on your flank. And although it's uh, thousands of miles to the Hawaiian Islands where the Pacific Fleet is now headquartered, the Japanese feel that this is having an enemy on your flank and so they attack the Pacific Fleet. They have no intention of invading Hawaii. They want to destroy the Pacific Fleet. People often ask me as well how Hitler can connect with the Japanese. Hitler's time to establish, as you're well aware, an Aryan race and the Japanese and the um, Asians are far from the quintessential Aryan race. Hitler uh, gets around this problem very cleverly. He decides to call them, uh, uh, um, he gives them the title of honorary Aryans, honorary Aryans. Uh, Roosevelt's leadership again shown in, here where he meets with de Gaulle and Churchill and here where he meets with Chiang Kai-shek and Churchill, and here with Stalin in uh, um, Tehran and also uh, at Yalta. You can see in this picture here though that Franklin Roosevelt is not a well man. His blood pressure is extremely high. He smokes four packs of unfiltered camels a day. He's not a well man. And the anti-Roosevelt people say that he gave away far too much in Yalta, but what Roosevelt was after at Yalta was to get an agreement with Stalin that Stalin and the Russians would enter the war as soon as the Germans were defeated, and they do. Uh, of course, it turns out to be unnecessary because we have the atomic bomb. And Roosevelt dies at Warm Springs in April of 1945. Doris now turns to Lyndon Johnson, and the book that she has on him is the Johnson and the American Dream, of course, by just Dorrance Kearns before she is married to uh, Goodwin. This is LBJ as a young boy, grows up in rural Texas. Uh, this is his father, who's a, a local politician. He's got the big ears that um, Lyndon inherits. Here's Lyndon and Lady Bird. Lady Bird's uh, uh, real name is um, Claudia Taylor, but when she's just when she's a young, uh, almost a baby, uh, her nanny says that she is pretty as a ladybird and she gets the nickname. And of course her initials then become LBJ, just like Johnson's and both of the girl's initials as well. Lyndon has the nickname of Landslide Lyndon when he gets to the Congress. And at this time in Texas politics, corruption is rampant. And Lyndon J wins his first race for um, the Congress by 87 volt votes. And you can see these guys have a knowing look on their face. Precinct 13 um, has been um, stuffed with ballots that allow Lyndon to win by 87 votes. But the, his, the competitors in uh, against Johnson at the same time are, are just as corrupt as Johnson has been in order to win this. And Johnson feels very much like uh, even Bill Clinton said, uh, if you don't win the election, you can't accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. But this is the famous picture of Precinct 13 and landslide Lyndon, which of course is a joke. Oh, I love this picture as well, Franking, shaking hands. He comes to Congress in 1937, and he is a New Deal man. He is whatever Roosevelt wants, Lyndon wants. And the cool thing about this picture, the guy in the middle is the governor of Texas, and Lyndon has hit the governor of Texas airbrushed out of the picture that he uses when he's campaigning. And so there's just a picture of Lyndon and FDR. The governor has been taken out of the picture and it looks to the people who see it. And he has a life-size um, cardboard cutout made of the picture shaking hands with FDR that he uses when he's campaigning. This is a famous picture of Rus uh, Russell, um, what's his first name? Uh, he is the... Uh, political leader of the Democrats, and he's getting what's called the treatment, Richard Russell, that's it. Uh, he's getting the treatment from 
Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon is a big guy. He gets very close in your face. And he tells you just exactly what it is that he wants and needs. I don't think Russell is getting the treatment here. I think this is just a posed photo because Russell and Lyndon are very close. In fact, Lyndon considers Russell to be his mentor. Johnson, of course, becomes vice presidential candidate with Jack Kennedy in 1960. And people are amazed because Johnson has been the majority leader in the Senate very powerful position in the Senate. And when Jack Kennedy, in an effort to get, um, to get um, his uh, vice president to be from either the South or the West, so that there's some sort of geographical connection between them, Kennedy, of course, from New England, um, he chooses Lyndon Johnson and uh, the, the um, scene majority leader from the Senate. And the story is that the Jack sends Bobby uh, Kennedy down to invite Lyndon to join the campaign. They're sure that Lyndon is not going to take the bait and become uh, the vice presidential candidate. And they're shocked when he does. And they say that all the blood runs from Jack's face and from Bobby's face when Lyndon agrees to be vice president. And of course, they're successful and elected in 1960. President Kennedy assassinated in November of 1963, a horrible, horrible time for the country. Uh, Lady Bird there to Lyndon's right and Jackie to Lyndon's left. Lyndon's gonna run for election to president in 1964 with Hubert Humphrey as his vice presidential running mate. I love this picture because Hubert Humphrey is afraid of horses and he, uh, they found the most gentle horse on the LBJ ranch. They get him on it. They take this picture and he get, immediately gets off. But Lyndon, of course, is elected in 1964 over Barry Goldwater. And Doris Kearns Goodwin feels that Lyndon makes a transformation between transactional leadership when he's in the Senate. <clears throat> he's making all these deals with the other senator. You give me this and I'll give you that. And he now be becomes transformative in his leadership and especially the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Segregated at this time, especially in the South. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan is a major force, especially again in the South. Lyndon is working with civil rights leaders in the White House, Martin Luther King to our left, Lyndon's to Lyndon's right. And when Lyndon signs the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, gives one of the first pens that he signed it with to uh, Martin Luther King. He also appoints Thurgood Marshall to the United States Supreme Court, the first black jurist on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, this is a picture taken in uh, April of 1968 when Martin Luther King, just before he's assassinated, uh, Jesse Jackson to Martin Luther King's right. And of course, in the summer, as it looks like uh, Bobby Kennedy might be getting the nomination, Lyndon has bowed out at the end of March, shocking the country and uh, most of the Democratic Party by saying that he will not run for a second term. Looks like Bobby's going to get the nomination. Bobby's assassinated, of course, in the summer of 1968. It's a horrible summer. And while Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, uh, argues, and successfully, I think, that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is Johnson's uh, most compelling example of leadership, especially transformational leadership. You just can't get around the fact of Johnson in Vietnam. Here he is, he had gallbladder surgery and the scar looks very much like the outline of Vietnam. He starts, of course, with the Rolling Thunder where they're bombing North Vietnam, uh, working here with Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. Lyndon makes several trips to Vietnam to exhort the troops to continue their efforts. Here's McNamara with General Westmoreland. He is the commander of the troops there from 1964 to 1968. Lyndon is um, completely taken by the battle at Quezon in January, December and January, December of 67 and January of 68. And apparently this has been, this is actually just a feint by the North Vietnamese and they are then attacking uh, nearly a hundred cities and towns in South Vietnam. 
uh, in what's called, of course, the Tet Offensive. And Johnson is convinced that it's going to be um, uh, a redo of Dien Bien Phu when the French are defeated by um, the Viet Minh. And he's convinced that they have to hold this strategic base at Khe San in northern South Vietnam, when in reality, um, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong are going to attack all these cities. And Khe San and Tet become uh, pretty much the tipping point prior to this, say, December of 67, January 68, the majority of Americans are in favor of the war, albeit a small majority, uh, but after Tet and uh, Quezon, uh, a majority are against the war. And the anti-war uh, demonstrators become louder and more vociferous, and Johnson is finally forced to not run for re-election. I love this picture of Johnson. He just cannot make a deal with Ho Chi Minh. He offers to do a kind of another TVA program that Franklin Roosevelt had done in the Mekong Delta and establish a bunch of um, dams and hydroelectricity for the Vietnamese people if they'll just end the war. But Ho Chi Minh will not end the war. Johnson just cannot find an answer. This is a picture of my friend Jack Tanney and myself in Vietnam, 1971, October of 71, in front of our white medical evacuation helicopter. I think the best books on Lyndon Johnson are done, and uh, I think there's no question done by Robert Carroll, a four volume set, um, Lind Lind the years of Lyndon Johnson, if you wanna know more about him. I like um, the path to power the best, but if you want uh, the full story, I'll look at all four of them. If you did, thanks for listening. If you need to reach me, I'm at jmglenn4 at gmail, and Marilee's got my phone number and gmail, uh, email. And if you have questions, I'll be glad to talk with you anytime about the, the book by Doris Kearns Goodwin or any things in American history. Uh, Marilee, did you get any questions while we were talking? Well, we received one question, and if you have any, we have time for just a few questions, but if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat box or the Q&A box. But one question that we received was if Lincoln was a strong athlete. Oh, absolutely. Lincoln's very athletic. He's a terrific wrestler. He's uh, six foot four and got really long arms and really long legs. He's very athletic. Um, he's a hard worker. He's known as the rail splitter when he's splitting logs and turning them into rails for fences. Yeah, very, very athletic fellow. Um, Theodore Roosevelt becomes very athletic as well after he's able to handle his, his asthma situation. He leads his children on uh, romps through the forest as well. Franklin Roosevelt, of course, athletic as well, uh, slightly uh, until he's established, uh, um, afflicted by polio in 1921. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, never terribly athletic, more uh, of the uh, thinker and reader. Great. Something else, Marilee? Were there any, did you see any other common threads between the four presidents and their leadership styles um, and their ability to be effective? I mean, she talks about the turnaround leadership of Franklin Roosevelt. Did you also see that same leadership quality within any of the other three or the crisis, you know, leadership? They all had major crises or opportunities to, to turn things around. Did you see that reflected between the other three? Doris Kearns Goodwin argues, and I think she's correct, all four of these individuals um, are, are afflicted by a problem initially. Uh, Lincoln is um, very, um, suffers from melancholia throughout his entire life. Um, has a difficult childhood. In fact, when his father dies, Lincoln doesn't even attend the funeral. Um, as far as Theodore Roosevelt, he's uh, afflicted by uh, asthma. Um, and of course, the major problem for him takes place in uh, 1884 when both his wife and his mother die on the exact same day. 
Franklin Roosevelt, of course, is, has to overcome polio, and of course he never does. And Lyndon Johnson, kind of like Lincoln, suffers from depression as well. Um, but he is, Johnson uh, overcomes this when he's elected to the Congress and then to the Senate. He then sees that people are supportive of the activities that he's engaged in. Uh, they all also have a major success in during their presidency. Lincoln, of course, the Emancipation Proclamation and of course, uh, winning the Civil War, no question about that. But uh, the transformational part is this um, Emancipation Proclamation. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, as we talked about, um, Doris Kearns Goodwin feels it's the coal strike of 1902. I I've suggested to you some other uh, options for the major success for Theodore Roosevelt. Um, the 100 days for FDR and of course uh, winning World War II. And then as far as Johnson is concerned, the Civil Rights Act is certainly transformational. Um, but with Johnson, I'm, when I was first reading this book, I had just a little bit of trouble connecting LBJ, I'll be honest with you, with the other three. Um, she, were, uh, Doris works for Lyndon Johnson uh, in the White House, and then she works with him at the ranch writing his memoirs, and shows he's very close with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and so she has a, an affinity for Lyndon Johnson, but I, I'm not convinced that you can connect him with Lincoln, FDR, and Theodore. They, the three of them, always appear in the top 10 lists of best presidents ever. Lyndon doesn't appear in that top 10 list. Uh, and of course, the reason is Vietnam. He just couldn't. Lyndon, prior to his presidency, is absolutely a transactional leader. He's willing to trade this for that. I, I want this and I'll give you that. You need something in your uh, home state, um, we'll work it out. But he does become a transformational leader insofar as civil rights is concerned. Uh, so uh, she would argue that the ambition that they all foreshow, uh, they have all overcome adversity and through the quality of resilience. And I used to tell my students that uh, persistence or resilience, they're kind of synonymous, um, is one of the greatest character traits that you can have so long as you're persistent in a positive goal. Uh, and all four of these individuals were. Would you consider Lincoln's authority for declaring the Emancipation Pro Proclamation as an executive order as it's common today with modern presidents? Was Lincoln among the first to exercise an action like this? You know, I don't know if he's the very first, but it is an executive order. And as I mentioned, he's convinced, and, and rightly so, I think, that the Constitution will not allow him to emancipate the slaves. And so he has to do it as a war measure. And so if we're in a war and uh, a president wants to, use, um, an ex wants to use the Emancipation Proclamation as an example, he could do it as the commander in chief. Um, Lincoln, though, is convinced that the Constitution allows slavery to continue. And had it not been for a war, for the Civil War, uh, I'm not sure that Lincoln would have been able to emancipate the slaves at that time. Thank you. Something can else? You give, yeah. Can you give an example of a leader today that is not transactional? That is not transactional. Uh, probably not a president. Um, presidents are, uh, the president is the boss and the buck stops here as Truman would say. Um, and if they have been a senator or a congressman or a governor prior to this time, they were probably um, transactional. They would trade things back and forth to get what it is that they wanted. But now as president, most of them are want to be called at least transformative when they accomplish something like uh, the New Deal or the coal strike or the Emancipation Proclamation uh, or the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964. 
Um, I can't think of any who would see themselves as transactional, although in fairness, behind the scenes, there's certainly a lot of quid pro quo, quid pro quo going on, trading this for that. Hey, if you'll go along with me on this, I'll get this for you as president of the United States. Certainly so, but I, I believe the presidents would prefer to be seen as transformational. That's great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for attending today and for your great questions. We're just really grateful to have, we had over 150 folks sign in today. So just fun to have alumni and friends join us from all around the world. And I know some former students of Dr. Glenn's and that's always fun. If you are ready to dive into the next book club pick, we will be reading The Rose Code by Kate Quinn. The discussion of this historical fiction novel that is based on a World War II story of three female code breakers in England and the spy that they must root out after the war is over will be held with Linda Conradi the end of March. We also hope for all Principia College alumni that you will be joining us this summer for reunion. We have two reunions back to back making up from 2020. So be sure to visit principialumni.org to see if it's your reunion this summer. And then if you enjoyed a talk like this, please join us for summer session where you can take classes just like what we've experienced tonight on history, politics, music, art, Bible, and lots more. And summer session will be back in person in ELSA from June 1st to the 11th. So again, visit principialumni.org for all of the information on that and our upcoming virtual events from tomorrow night's talk to with the Principia trustees to monitor night live. So we hope that you have a wonderful evening can, and continue to ponder the power of the transactional and transformational leadership and thinking about it through the examples that we have in our world today. Thank you all so much for joining and have a great night.